ready? Well, it's my delight to have Danny Henderson here on ExoPolitics today. Welcome, Danny. Hi, Dr. Michael. Thank you so much. It is such a thrill to be on your show. Well, I know you've interviewed me and many others on your YouTube channel, so I'm very happy to be able to kind of like get to know a little bit about you. And in going into your background, really amazing, some of the things you've done. And I guess I need to begin with these clairvoyant medium abilities that you displayed from a very early age. So when did you have those abilities or when did you notice that you were different to others around you? Um, it's something that well, I always call it being born awake. And I know that word is used so frequently in this day and age in the 2020s. Um, but I could always see I could see everything I could see, you know, the beings, the light beings, I could see the demonics, we lived in a really um, a poor area in uh, Sussex in England, and the house was haunted and the houses were built on former battleground. Like my road was called Cavalry Crescent. Um, and it just was soaked in misery and poverty and alcoholism and drug abuse and children being beaten because in the 70s, you know, you smack your kids around. And so when you have an area that dense, it absorbs that frequency and greatest energy always wins. So a lot of what I saw was really dark, demonic. Um, and honestly, from the first, honestly, waking awakenings and memories um, always in like another person with my mother or my dad or my brother or you know when somebody was angry it wouldn't be the sound that came out it would be color that came out if somebody was laughing it would be color it would be it it was so easy there was a, like people call it an aura or, or electromagnetic field I prefer to call it the electromagnetic field um, I could always see through and adults could never I always knew the bad ones you know, you get the smells, you get the feelings, you get the, you can see them, you can hear their demons screaming on them. Um, I remember one time I walk, was walking past his boy, he was so handsome. He looked like what we'd call the Archangel Michael depiction. And he's looking at me and I'm so aware of myself, I'm only 11 and he's looking at me. And right as he got into my field, all I could hear was screaming internally in him, around him. Such frightening, guttural, screaming, awful noises. He turned out to be one of the biggest serial killers ever in the whole of England. And I won't say his name, he doesn't deserve that. Um, why would we put any attention on the dark? He's in prison forever. He murdered so many 15 year old girls, 16, 17 year old girls. Um, and uh, it was, and th that kind of thing happened all the time. It still does, it still does. So, when were your earliest abilities or when did you first begin seeing these uh, spirits and you begin communicating with them? What was it like? Um, yeah. How far back does that go? Well, one of my very first memories ever of all time is still being in the crib. So my mother says I was fully fluent in speaking at 19 months, which is quite young for a, a child. Um, and I haven't stopped since. Um, and uh, so I remember uh, being aware of being put back in my crib and I'm a baby and I remember leaning back onto the wooden bar you know I remember feeling that feeling and being a little bit confused and then there's a beautiful being who's in the shadow in the corner of the room but he's not scary and he's just put me back in the crib now I don't have a dramatic abduction story thank god I didn't sign up for that in this incarnation. Um, so as he puts back the door opens and my mum comes in and says to my dad, oh, she's awake. So my mum picks me up, puts me on her hip, takes me into the garden, but it's dark. And I remember being confused. Why is it dark? I could see the stars and I was annoyed. I was a child. I couldn't fully speak at this point. And I started crying and then my mum got really annoyed because I wouldn't shut up. But I couldn't communicate like you. I remember being this being knowing so much in this bloody tiny body that it was unbelievably suffocating and frustrating that you're in this and the person can't understand you. And you, you have to be carried around every I remember kids being on my mum's hip and kids grabbing my leg. And it's so annoying when you're a baby, like, don't do that. <laughs> but yeah, I guess that's really the earliest memory is being put back in my crib from being upstairs. So when did you start to counsel people using your, your psychic abilities? Well, when I left school, I trained to be a nursery nurse at Children's Nanny. Uh, I just knew the pain inside the children, hence having explained, also went through a 
you know, as we often we do, we really kind of bumpy childhood. A lot of other kids in my area did too. There were terrible things happening to kids at school. Uh, there was a lot of sexual abuse going on um, in Sussex, um, in Eastbourne during that time. Um, so I really wanted to love on kids. I had a real passion. So qualified as a children's nanny and then um, started with that. So sort of, you know, it's a very natural thing as well. I think you come in with a natural nature. It's not so much always your nurture, but your program, your blueprint, your DNA, you know, matrix within you um, kind of, you know, at leads you almost. Um, and then uh, in 2000, so I, I was a nursery nurse for a long time. Then I went back to college and started to be a broadcast journalism. So went into that for a while. Then ultimately 2000 and I think it was nine when I got my full of my full qualifications as a clinical hypnotherapist and an NLP practitioner at Neuro Linguistic Programmer um, at practitioner level. So since then, I've had a full time uh, practice um, with people, children, families, teenagers, um, older people. Yeah. That's fascinating. Now, you mentioned like very early on, you saw this spiritual being. Um, uh, that wasn't a spiritual being. That, yeah, that wasn't a spirit being. That wasn't angelic. That was an extraterrestrial. Okay, beautiful... that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. yeah. So that was an extraterrestrial. And, and, and what did you find out about that extraterrestrial? Is that someone that you have continued to have contact with? Uh, I mean, you were what, 18 months, 19 months, something yeah. like that? Yeah, if that. I think I was younger than that. Um, this beautiful beloved, um, his name is Annex, and we have come to learn about Annex through Elena Danam and her work. And Annex is her, um, her her DNA, her star father. He's connected to her. Um, and then um, it was so beautiful to have the memories that I knew were real confirmed um, be, and sitting with Elena and her communicating with Thorhan, her, the person that rescued her, the Pleiadian military man, and Annex, who is an Egoroth, who has one of those beautiful, um, you know, huge, huge, beautiful, beautiful head. And it was interesting because I had, you know, you forget so much. The thing is, we can't go through this life that can be tricky enough already and know everything because this time was always going to happen. There was always going to be this awakening in these 2020 times, always. And so that's why so many people are waking up to their memories. To their, some are making stuff up to, some are riding the, oh, it's the galactic train, let's get on it. Um, but I was, uh, it's so good I had a witness too. So I was sitting uh, on my laptop talking to Asha and Asha was on stage at our conference, which I know we're going to come to. And Asha um, uh, has two twin girls who are in their 20s with Ketsa Shah. Ketsa Shah is the shaman um, that spoke at our, our, um, our conference too, Ketsa Shah. And I was, so I was talking to Asha um, and then all of a sudden the frequency shifts in the room, which it always does when someone's coming. If it's going to be a spiritual being, angelic frequency or a regular earthbound spirit, it's a different frequency that you feel that I feel in my body. If it is a galactic um, other off world being physical solid person, as opposed to a spirit being, because a very, very big difference, it's a different feeling in the body I get it in the back of the neck there's more of a high static electromagnetic frequency when the so I'm sitting chatting to um Asha like I'm looking at you now and I feel the frequency in the room shift and I look and it's Annex but I have didn't recognize him in that moment he made me jump so much and he was this just beautiful beautiful he, he didn't walk over the room Michael he he glided he moved like this. It was so beautiful. He must have been about nine foot tall. I'm like sitting on the sofa with my legs out in front of me. And so I look up and he's just beaming, beaming down. And because of the angle I'm looking up at his face, it's kind of this shape, you know, when he's got these beautiful eyes and he was wearing like a, I feel like I'm wearing like a navy blue, uh, navy blue. Um, uh, I thought it was more like a cloak, but because he was gliding like this and he's beaming love at me. And then, and then I look across the room and there is a man because my house in Costa Rica had all glass walls because I was in the jungle canopy. So I look across the room at the same nanosecond because you know when something's happening, we have a thousand different quantum thoughts in that one second. I look across and there is a man standing there, tall man, blonde hair, and his hair was straight to here, like straight, and then it went all wavy, beautiful man bit muscles like he was wearing a white suit and it was tight tight to his skin so you could see his outline 
And I saw them like both at the same time and I screamed F off because they made me jump and I wasn't ready for it. And then this man who turned out to be Thorhan, he just kind of looked around because he was protecting, he was watching outside the area and he, Thorham kind of just smirked and then, and Annex was just kind of beaming. And then that was it. And then my friend Ash is like, what, what? I went, Bohemians in my house. And she's like, get on your court and drive down the mountain. I'm like, no, no, because I knew I knew them. You know, it was a real abrupt awakening in that regard and then went on to confirm because I don't think anyone should talk about any being of any kind whatsoever, unless it's the actual reality, unless it's the actual proof. You know, you've got to make sure it's not a screen memory, a made up memory, a desperation to want to be involved in, in life in that way, uh, or to be part of this opening, this spiritual galactic opening that's been happening within so many people. So, yeah, so that kind of brings you up to date there. So you recognized Annex or when you were young, I mean, that was the name of the being that appeared before you, Annex. And then later on, I mean, many decades later, Elena writes her book, uh, I, I guess, A Gift from the Stars, and she mentions Annex. And, and is that when you made the connection that, hey, this being I met when I was uh, in the crib back, back, you know, being a year and a half is the same being that Elena was writing about in her book? No, I made the connection directly with Elena because we've been, we're already friends and, you know, and it's better to get it from the horse's mouth and just assume because I, you know, I haven't even read Gift from the Stars because I was in Costa Rica at the time and you just cannot get anything delivered there. Um, but um, obviously now in the, now that I'm physically back in, uh, you know, the Western world, I've got her latest, uh, which I've been really enjoying. Uh, but no, it wasn't from reading her book. And so when Annex put me back in my crib when I was a baby, I did not know his name. I knew his face. I knew his beingness. I knew the size and the height of him. And that's what I saw in the bedroom. And so when I had a communication with Annex through Elena, that was confirmed then, which was great. And I'm so glad that, you know, uh, I've seen them too. I know that they're all part of a team. They're part of her team. Perfect. So you've actually had physical encounters with both Annex and Thorhan Eretian yes. in your own home. Yes. Uh, which really corroborates what Elena is is saying about uh, them being real physical beings that she's had meetings with uh, many times. Yes. And Commander Ardana and Valnek also. You want to tell us more about your meetings with uh, Ardana and uh, Valnek? I mean, yes. how that happened? Yes. So there was one particular day where um, Elena was being threatened, um, which unfortunately has been a lot of her journey by men, mostly men, really violently, verbally abusing her and attacking and targeting her. And there was a man who was really angry that she was discussing part of her work and her experience on and off planet. And he was going to do this to her publicly and that to her publicly. And she is a really, really tender heart. I mean, she's a warrior, but she's a human. And she called me and she was really, really deeply, deeply upset. <clears throat> and it's really hard to see someone you love so much go through so much, you know, to try and help so many uh, people awake, awakening in, in this time of humanity. And um, I, I put the phone down and I really went into a rage. I'm a really, really passionate, feisty person. And I felt it was such an injustice for upstairs to to allow her to be in such a state. And I was really angry um, and I was screaming and swearing and petitioning basically to them. And I was saying, how dare you? How dare you allow her to be so hurt? You know, and of course it wasn't their doing. I was just in the moment trying to, you know, feeling for my friend. Um, and then uh, how Thorhan and Commander Ardana appeared in that moment was through this gigantic, like this huge bubble this massive, massive bubble. And what's so incredibly beautiful is uh, in the moment that it happened, me recognizing their physical form, Michael, because they're bigger than us. And it was another way of me knowing that I'm not imagining this. This is, oh my God, they were much, they were bigger. So they were in this kind of this plasma bubble. And I'm going to show you that because I've got a picture on my phone. I didn't think to prepare that picture. I didn't know we were going to go here, um, but I'll find it. Um, but yeah, this kind of plasma. Okay, you can send it to me and I'll put it up at this point. Okay, okay, great. So I can just talk about it. And then, like, okay, I'll, that's about the next picture. I'll tell you about Commander Ardana. And so I'm yelling and screaming. So they both appear in this huge plasma bubble. Um, and they're both looking at me. And, I, and Ardana's saying something to him. And he says to me, Tell her it will not be what she thinks it will be. 
um and then they and then they went and I'm like holy shit that was Ardana and Thorhan so I call Elena and I say listen this just happened um and and I I know you're so terribly upset nobody can communicate with you right now nothing was they couldn't connect with her in that moment she was just gone it was she was frightened and she was just upset and then I told her um what he said and then she then confirmed later that day and then we had another conversation where she calmed down and then I was kind of feeling a bit bad for like you know going to beat them all up <laughs> because look after my girl kind of thing because you know can, you can't even imagine the role that Elena is in you know and 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 the things that she has to go through but the beautiful things that she brings for us too you know so I'm glad that you know I, I'm you know I know the team too um and then with Valnick that was really fascinating it was November 6th of 2021 um and there's been there have been a lot of interruptions in the galactic information around uh, or September, October, there were things that weren't quite right. And there was a person who at one point was very much plugged into um, Valnek, who was, a, uh, who was a, um, a, from the Pleiades and also part of this military setup. And then something was just going wrong. Something was just miswiring. I get a phone call from Alex Collier, who represents the Andromedans. And Alex Collier said to me, Danny, there's a problem. And at the same time, Elena, supporting the Pleiadians, the Galactic Federation of Worlds, says there's an issue. <clears throat> now, because I knew this person extremely well, uh, who was misinforming, um, it was advised that this person step down because we were concerned this person was being interfered with, which can happen, which can happen. Um, anyway, this person decided they weren't going to um, step down and continue to this day. Uh, and it was about that was so then that happened and then we were I was on a, a FaceTime call with Elena and you know the day it was the day it was was when she had gone to the void when she had met with Una this lady Una who come to her then Una took her and she met with the nine who live in the void um which sounds so Star Trek -y. anyone just you know, logging on to your channel right now that's never seen you, they'd be like, what? I get that. I get that. But those people are so in the minority now. They are so in the minority. Nobody cares what they think anymore if they don't believe anything uh, because it's too important how our world is, is ascending and evolving to worry about them. So um, Elena went, met with Una, met the Cedars and was absolutely shaken up. She was shaken up to a degree that was really, really hard on her. She saw black goo. She saw how many people are run by AI, how many people are infected. And she just couldn't, it's too much. It's too much for one human woman to have to handle and cope. So I'm like, all right, come on girl, come on, let's get on a call. Just get on FaceTime, just come and sit in front of me. Um, you know, cause she was shaking and you imagine seeing the things that she saw and that she couldn't just say to humanity blur, by the way, a lot of the people you follow are AI, they're infected, they're black goo, they're this, they're that. So she and I were sitting uh, like this and we were just talking to each other um, and she's taking deep breaths and, uh, and we're talking and then she's like, Danny, look, what, look at the lights in your room. Now my house in Costa Rica had the glass windows and so at night, because the jungle is completely black, you don't see anything. All you might see is the little light, a little light that I'm using on Zoom. That's it. But I'm saying to her, I said, what? She said, Danny, the room is full of light. And I said, take a picture because I don't see what you're seeing. I can't see it. I can only see you, Elena. So she took a photograph. And then when we looked at that photograph, you can see you can see in the background, one of the bubbles I mentioned that I saw Thorhan and Commander Ardana in, one of the bubbles behind me. And if you make that enlarged, you can see the outline of Valnek. Now, Valnek has been visiting Elena Danan since she, well, he was part of her rescue when she was nine years old. Thank God she's kept all her diaries where she would draw him. Her 12 and 13 year old little girl diaries, she's still got her drawings of him. He's got a, an interesting kind of hook nose, comes down. Um, and so she said, oh my God. I said, who is that in the bubble? She said, I know. And then she outlined him in the bubble so we could see him clearer. So that's what is this photograph. So I'll send that to you so you can 
share it with the audience and they can enjoy it too. And there are other things in that photograph too, but enough enough on that at, at this moment. So um, I think at this point, it's worth just kind of pointing out that these things that you're that you were seeing um you know in physically and uh, perhaps there was some psychic element in there that you actually have quite a record as a very accurate psychic going back many many decades and i, I was intrigued looking at one of these old youtubes from 2010 where you were taken blindfold mm. to the old uh, theater a very famous old theater in london taken blindfold there by, a, I guess it was a television crew. Yeah. And uh, they, they they were testing your psychic ability. So you want to tell us what, what happened there? Yeah. So uh, that was, so, okay, the word psychic, the real explanation of that word, it's the Greek word for soul. That's it, it's soul. Um, I personally don't like the word psychic in the way that the Western world uses it. It's so overused, you know, and, you know, I've done readings and had sessions and I've been wrong. I've been wrong about timings, about years, about dates and stuff. So, you know, I don't know that anyone can ever be 100% accurate in that way. So I don't establish or attach myself to that word. Uh, clairvoyant, 100%, absolutely. A medium, yes. The the beloveds show up a lot. Um, so this company said, what makes you... I was, on, I was on television at the time. I was on a television show um, where the public could call me live. They would ask me either for therapy sessions, for relationship counseling, or uh, an angel card reading, or something like that. And it was live. Uh, and London was very advanced. It was a very advanced thing for London, Britain, Britain to be doing. Um, and so, so this TV company said, ah, there are so many psychics, what makes you different? And I said, I don't know. Um, and they said, well, what do you think you could do? And this idea just popped in my head. And I said, I think if you blindfold me, and you take me somewhere, I'll be able to tell you where I am. Now, Dr. Michael, I had never done that in my life, never. I didn't even know it was a thing. So they took me, they took me to, it turned out to be a theatre in Drury Lane, um, very famous uh, theatre. And I remember they blindfolded me and I'm walking inside. Now I assumed that all my senses would be out here, that I would be reading the energy out here, you know, because I can't see. I was so wrong. What happened was because my sight was gone, I went in inside and it's very quiet in there. And it was a whole different experience. I didn't like it at first, kind of felt uncomfortable. And so I'm like, oh my God. And I had to totally rely like on inside in this quiet place on the inside, as opposed to having extrasensory overload out here, because I'm trying to work with four senses instead of and so it was five senses instead of six or seven. Um, and so I was able to feel and see um, without my physical sight where I was. I could see there was a dome. Um, I could hear screaming. Um, I knew people had died in that building before I still knew it was a theater building. And it turned out there'd been a massive fire. People were trampled to death. Um, and another time somebody shouted out fire um, and people lost and there was no fire and people lost their lives. Um, one of the other places they took me that was really physically impactful was they, they blindfolded me. They took me into a, um, a uh, it was in Golden Square. The place is called Golden Square and it used to be called Absolute Radio. So I'm blindfolded and they guide me in and I don't know where the hell I am and I can hear music. And my first instinct says, oh, I'm inside of a, a, a showroom, a car showroom. That's what it felt like. Um, and then I start walking down these stairs and all of a sudden I think I'm going to buckle. I'm going to, I'm going to, I can feel the depths of something horrific and it's really scary and I can feel it with all my senses. And then I'm trying to steady myself because I feel all off balance and the man or the director is kind of guiding me down the stairs. And then I said to him something like, oh my God, I feel like I'm in hell. So then we go down a corridor and I'm still blindfold. And then I remember looking through my third eye, looking with my senses, and what I could see was this gigantic, massive hole, this massive hole. It was so deep, and there were people in it, and there were people around it, and there was noise, and there were horses, and there, in the corner over there, were three men wearing like sackcloth, and they were praying. They were huddled together. They weren't looking into the pit. They were looking at each other, and they were praying like this. Anyway, I'm listening to the screaming. I'm looking. The smell is terrible because all your senses, when you when you lock into a timeline, 
You can clairvoyantly see it. You hear it clairaudiently. You feel it clairsentiently. You see it clairvoyantly. You could uh, this, the tongue one when you can taste clair clair Gustave, the French word for Gustave. It's, I forget what it is right now. But <clears throat> anyway, so I I say to the girl that the who's part of this whole thing. I say to her, "Is this the site of the bubonic plague, the Black Plague?" And she says, "Yes, it is." And I was unwell for a day after that because I didn't put up enough protection. I got so emotionally involved in that particular scene. Anyway, it turns out that Golden Square, that square in London where I went, is a site of a plague pit. 4,000 people died over a month, one month period. And the bodies, a lot of the bodies were buried deep there, deep, deep, deep down there. And they say that the DJs, because it's a radio uh, play a radio broadcasting uh, uh, station that a lot of the DJs are scared to be down there at night because they hear noises and they yeah so that was very haunted so yeah that, that was another of my blindfold experiences that you know that I nailed okay all right so you, you're having contact as a as a child uh, as a infant really you have these advanced medium clairvoyant skills you're being taken around London in blindfold, in correctly intuiting where you are. You're, you're clearly a very old soul in this life. So do you know about your past lives? Do you know anything about whether it was some past incarnations on Earth, whether you have some sort of starseed origins you want to share with the audience? You know, one of the reasons why I rarely speak on like this and why I support, you know, I interview you, I have you on round tables, you're a speaker at our conference. One of the main reasons why I rarely share, and I'm only sharing with you because I love you. Um, and, you know, people keep asking. And so you're like, and you invited me and you're the best person I can think of that I would want to sit and share, you know, a lot of my story. But I don't I don't want the attention on, you know, my abilities, my so much my my past history or my star um, connections, uh, because I don't see how that can benefit in the role that I'm in. But I'm so happy to, to share. Um, I'm totally and utterly um, Pleiadian. I have been. Um, with um, a, a, a family member upstairs to um, the star system where I have lived. Um, I've been shown that very recently because uh, sometimes, you know, no matter what you're doing, you're like, I don't think I can do this. This is too much. It's too hard. It's this, it's that. And because some days we all have those days. We all have those days, you know, no matter what we're doing in our lives um, and past lives, many. Um, and I, the first one I remember is being a little, um, little a little match girl a little a little homeless scrap on the trying to just nothing this little tiny four-year-old child no family freezing cold trying to sell matches or something um and freezing to death um it's so funny how you see people who have a public you know platform and they're like i was cleopatra i was this i was the king of the fairies i'm like no i was a little pauper <laughs> I died on the side of the road. Nobody loved me. You know, um, I think we got it. People need to kind of like level down, you know, like just level down. I think and know that we've all have past lives. I do past life regression. Um, and uh, it's so beautiful. So when people see in this life they're in now, when they connect to a past life part of them, how the story always matches a part of where they're at in that moment um it, it's it's remarkable but um so past lives um I haven't looked to see whether I'm some like you know aurora on starship kind of figure or whatever I, I you know but there are things I, I have seen that you know it, I'll just I'm just it, it feels silly to share it it's embarrassing <laughs> you know so okay all right well I do find past life regression really something that's very helpful. I mean, I wasn't such a big fan of past life regression until I started listening to Dolores Cannon's uh, series, uh, The yeah. Convoluted Universe and her other books. And, and I realized that, wow, this is actually a, a great way of corroborating all the other information, because in my exopolitics research, I, I corroborate many events by looking at different sources. So past life regression is another source. And one of the things that I'm finding uh, there's a lot of people that are remembering their lives, past lives in Atlantis. And uh, and so that's fascinating because it seems that this is a really big issue for many, many souls that are incarnating 
their memories of past lives in Atlantis and how Atlantis was a, what really was a grand experiment that lasted many thousands of years that achieved great things but ended really terribly and they and they wanting to come back to make sure it doesn't happen again so does that kind of like resonate for you were you part of that wave of former Atlanteans that are now here a um, couple of things to say on that um, is, well, number one, I am so much more Lemurian is my Andara. Uh, this is a crystal that largely is connected with the Lemurian time. The Lemurian time was the time before Atlantis. And people don't seem to understand when we're told that Atlantis, where it fell was Santorini, you know, the Greek island Santorini. Um, people were never told the reality of Atlantis. Atlantis wasn't a place. It was continents. It was the way of the world. It had, it was thousands and thousands and thousands of miles, you know, and, you know, this, so it, it stretched so far and, and part of it went down. Um, well, Bermuda Triangle is interesting and I, I won't say any more than that. I will say that the military on our planet know every single major part. They know the Stargates, they know everything. So anybody out there who's curious that military, wherever there's a base, wherever there's a whatever, be rest assured there's a star portal or a gate up there or, or some nefarious activities. Um, but Lemuria um, is definitely where I'm more um, connected with. And that was the time before Atlantis. And the Atlanteans took down Lemuria. They took Lemuria down. The Lemurians were more... Um, we, we, we would remember that beautiful um, Avatar film where everyone sits around the tree and they're all harmonizing, you know, loving on each other with their hearts. That, that was the Lemurian way. We knew the plants. We, we pulse with the, the heart of Mother Earth. And, and the Atlantean aspect for me was much harsher environment, much harsher. So in my memories, much harsher to be there, although there was much, much beauty. But over the years, as uh, being in this body and witnessing what I'm witnessing, I've said a thousand times, this is Atlantis, this is Atlantis, the corruption, the cruelty, the sexual depravity, the experimentation that happened in Atlantis, which is one of the reasons why it was taken down. It could not be allowed this sickening of the mind of the humans and the way they were infiltrated, the trying to be the best scientist, be the best experimenter, the sexual gratification, those kinds of things that happened. You know, that was one of the reasons why Atlantis was taken down. That cannot be. That cannot be. Very interesting that you mentioned uh, Lemuria and, and Avatar, because uh, the... the uh... Avatar 2, The Way of Water, is just opening up uh, today in, in, the, in the US. So uh, we're planning to see it sometime this, this weekend. But, uh, okay, that's, that's good to know uh, that you have more of that Lemurian connection. I mean, just to kind of like, um, I can say quite clearly, I have absolutely no Atlantean connection, uh, but I have a very strong Lemurian connection, which is very interesting. And, and I remember my... One of my anyway, so yeah, let's let's uh, let's get to what you encountered when you're doing hypnotherapy, past life regression. Did you come across people that had these memories, whether it was Atlantis, whether it was Lemuria? Yeah, um, I absolutely in, on every level. And I know before we started recording, we were mentioning you know different ways of helping people uh, get through their trauma and remember their memories and to recognize what is in this life, what is in the cellular structure within the body, because every experience we've had in every lifetime records. So when we come in with this avatar, this body, that those memories are still there. They're still intact within you. Um, and I've had many different people see themselves as different beings, that they look different. I've had many people who remember one lady um, who was so delighted her she was disabled in her physical body and she was really going downhill and I went to her house to do some work with her and she saw herself as a kind of octopus um, a being like a light being and and she was crying and she was shaking in her chair her wheelchair and she's like oh my god I needed to see myself being able to fully move and this lady didn't have that much um, time to live um not that it is really of consequence here, but I ordained as a minister in 2004 
Um, and I only did that. My main driver was to marry gay people uh, because it was such a taboo. And I don't, I just push them all aside. I don't do, deal with taboos or, or rules or authority. No one is allowed to say who can and who cannot get married. I feel like not on my watch. Um, so I qualified as a minister so I could legally marry people. And so I would do in my ministry, visit people who were maybe at end of life. Um, and this lady was, and it was such a joy. Um, uh, I've forgotten about this. Um, just to see her, uh, the joy in her face, you know, because she remembered and then she could remember in her own body that was so stiff and stuck and she could hardly move um, herself as an octopus. And then all of a sudden she starts really wailing and with joy. And there were all these other beings that looked the same like octopi, like coming in around her. And it was like part of her, her journey home was for her to be able to see herself in other beingnesses because obviously we know earth is not the only planet with beings and there aren't just these humans here there are many different humans everywhere in the universe and other beautiful physical beings too so i did want to know a little bit about the kind of hypnotherapy work that you did and you mentioned that you're a registered nurse and you did uh, neuro-linguistic uh, uh, programming as well you know it kind of makes me think of um John Mack, the uh, Harvard psychiatrist, who, who's doing that kind of, you know, related work, uh, and uh, he comes across abductions, you know, many people experiencing abductions. So did you encounter that? I'm sorry, I've got to go back one step, because I'm not a registered nurse. I'm a qualified nursery nurse, as in children's nanny. So although we learned biology and anatomy, I never studied medically to to nurse a child, just so I'm not an RN or an SRN, so just to make that difference. Mm -hmm. um, and you asked me, did I come across people who have been abducted um, in my clinical hypnotherapy sessions? Yeah, whether it was a military abduction or an extraterrestrial abduction, was that something you encountered? Yes, absolutely. And both uh, a gray abduction, reptilian abduction, and also military and secret space program although i think we decided to all just delete that um expression because there's nothing secret about it i think we're calling it deep space programs now yeah we've decided us the people um decided with that we took that from the military we took that away from them they don't have that power anymore uh, we decided what we're calling it um so i have worked with um well i can name him actually one in particular recently our dear beloved chris o'connor who was in space and military uh, manufacturing uh, equipment uh, and came back to Earth and bought the best of the best in his memories. And this is a free energy device that does incredible things in the body. Um, so he came when I was living in Costa Rica. Um, he came to visit with me for four days and we did four intense days of intense therapy uh, you know, helping with PTSD, helping him retrieve memories, helping him understand. And that was a combination of past life regression therapy, deep clinical hypnotherapy, one-to-one -one counseling, talking therapy. Um, and it was beautiful. And he was able to retrieve a lot of his memories, which he has been talking about. And I know that he's going to be sharing more. Um, Chris O'Connor, to me, is one of the single most fascinating people out of everyone that has come out openly at this time. And he, as you know, he was a speaker at our conference. Um, he was abducted at two and age progressed, not regressed, progressed. So from two, he went from two to 20 something, which is just a mind blowing concept that seems too ridiculous to even try and understand because we're so told this is not possible. This is not a, a, a possibility, but of course it is. And the militaries have known about this forever. Um, so with him, it was a combination of, of um, him uh, in a military position, uh, negotiating with other beings, being attacked, being harmed, um, so many different ways, so many different ways. And then himself also remembering himself as other beings in other carnations, uh, human uh, incarnations um, on this planet and on other planets too. So there's one example I can give you rather than a random yes to, you know, but specifically hone in on one person who can also validate their own truth. Because, you know, we're at the stage now where we need evidence. We, we all demand it. We want physical proof. We want people who know each other, who know the same people, that there can be no question 
that they're lying and fabricating and misleading humanity. Yeah, totally agree. I think uh, that's that's what I like to do. And I'm noticing that you're doing a lot of that as well, which is which is great. I mean, totally independent of what I was doing. I know I know you did uh, an interview recently with uh, Jean-Charles Moyen, Chris O'Connor and Tony Rodriguez, where you got them to talk about their respective experiences and how they recognized each other at the Galactic Spiritual Connection Conference. So you want to talk about that? That has been one of the absolute highlights of my life. I mean, not only do I love these men and we've all known each other before, but for the three of them to physically come together, you know, it's like I knew them all before. Um, the only person I hadn't physically met in at that time of the conference was Jean Charles being in Canada, but I'd already met, and I know you've known Jean Charles Moyen for years, also important to say that you've known him for absolutely years and years. Um, and when the three men, physically met it was like an unlocking a key a frequency they already had feelings about each other but they didn't trust because they really put themselves through the mincer when it comes to really being strict about what they do remember about their experiences off planet but when they did all come together it just changed the game completely the other thing alongside this that we created every single being in that room. There was nearly a thousand people there. Um, every single being, everyone that even wanted to get there but couldn't, there was such a focus that we, that we, we just amplified the 4D, that 4D love. And people are forever changed. And so within that unlocking frequency, that DNA frequency code within those three men in particular, they were able to validate, to say, Jean-Charles, to... Tony Rodriguez, I came to your room when you were a little guy. And Tony Rodriguez saying, oh, my God, I remember I was calling out for my friend Charlie. And then and then uh, Tony's mom saying, oh, that's nice. You've got a play, uh, an invisible friend. And Tony's like, no, mom, he's real. And then John Charles confirming that we only know him as John Charles. We don't know him as Charlie. And that was his childhood nickname, Charlie. And then they worked out the timeline. Uh, Tony Rodriguez was kidnapped by a, an Illuminati family uh, that organized for off-planet terrestrials, Greys at that time, to kidnap him. Um, and then it turns out that Jean Charles was kidnapped into a military program after having a hospitalized situation when he was 13. So these men have been mapping, mapping, mapping timelines and everything. And then with uh, Chris O'Connor, again, same thing. All of the three men have all had interactions. And that, again... And so, yes, bring them on my channel uh, to, 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 to help others too, but to show this is true. These things happen. The, and I said to all three men, you know how beautiful you already had established your independent, your independent um, platforms. And now that you connected at the conference, the Galactic Spiritual Informers Connection, it's, it's on. Now it, the revelations, I feel like dis disclosure is ramping up like this. Just beautifully, this is this beautiful, beautiful, gentle movement that, that, that is unfolding every day in every way. So those things are crucially important, in my opinion. Yeah, I thought that was a, an excellent interview. And I really um, thought it was very significant that Tony and Jean-Charles recognized each other prior to Tony's abduction and recruitment into the I guess deep space program, as we as we're going to start calling it now, and that was when he was ten. But when he was seven, he meets with uh, Jean Charles and his his best friend, and immediately the thing that occurred to me was that oh wow, Tony, you weren't a victim at all. You actually were a honeypot operation. You were actually a double agent. That you your mission was to set up the Illuminati. You were never a victim of the Illuminati that you were setting them up. It was a sting operation, that he was a member of the Galactic Federation, and, and he chose to incarnate to be born in that family, to go through life so that he would meet that young child of an Illuminati family who would then, in punishment, recruit him. But he would have all of those memories, all of those experiences, which would then reveal the underbelly of the beast. And, and that's very important. And I think there's a lot of people like that I remember, I don't know, if, I think you have interviewed him, if not, you should, uh, Niara Islay, a former Air Force radar specialist, and uh, she had a similar thing too, where she 
was also abducted and she was like abused by the Illuminati or by the uh, deep space operatives. And then at a certain time, one of the ETs looked at her and said, oh, no, you, you, sh you shouldn't mess around with this one. She belongs to them. <laughs> so so this is this is the thing that's happening a lot of people that you know uh, uh, see themselves as victims for these abductions one of the things to keep in mind is that actually the uh the, the galactics do insert operatives into these programs to get data to collect it all and that's very important and certainly with chris so with uh, john charles and tony i think that that became very clear and i think there are others like niare who are you know these kind of like part of these sting operations by the galactic federation to entrap the deep state yeah you know with tony one of the things i'm the happiest for for him tony wood riggs is that he would always play such a low key. He, he wasn't playing, he was just being himself, but he, it was always very low key and uh, he could never accept. And this is a key for me. When I know someone's telling the truth, I'm looking for the frequency that emits from them, their heart, the frequency of their heart, their tone, their voice, the voice tones um, and their uh, humbleness. That's a key. Um, and it wasn't until he really got on stage at the conference and when he was receiving so much love and so much confirmation that I was able to say to him, Tony, can you now recognize that you belonged on that stage with all those other beautiful people, that you are part of this? You weren't just a cargo boy who was put in a military program, taken to Mars colony, taken to Ceres colony, colony and working in the cargo bay. Can you just be more than that? And it's taken Tony quite some time to really allow himself to, to assimilate and, and own the fact that he's super special part of Disclosure on planet Earth right now. Uh, he definitely is. And uh, as you said, um, all of these men that you've been interviewing and, and women that you've been interviewing all have important pieces of the puzzle. And, and, I, and I understand that the work that lies before us is connecting all of that to understand this this vast jigsaw puzzle. Now, one of the things that uh, recently emerged was um, Elena Danan was, was had met with Enki. Now, she's met him several times and he's given her information. But one of those pieces of information that was uh, really, I thought, fascinating was that he said the uh, old Anunnaki bases on Saturn, on the actual planet Saturn, we're not talking one of the moons, that these were handed off to the Earth Alliance. And you interviewed Elena and Chris O'Connor, and there was some important corroboration. So you want to tell us what, what happened there? Well, it's so interesting because, you know, even, so we do not know everything. Things are in, unfolding. Let's just take the speakers at the Galactic Spiritual Informers Connection, which we're calling JISIC, because it's much quicker to say JISIC. Even those speakers do not all know every single step, as you know yourself, because you are also a speaker. It is unfolding. And my point in saying that is this. We did not know, any of us, when I created the conference 19 months ago, came up with the idea, hanging out with Alex Collier, hanging out with Tony Wood Riggs and saying, hey, if I put on a conference, would you guys want to speak? And that was the start of it. That was the spark of it. Um, and we no, no one knew about giants nobody knew about the anunnaki giants awakening or them being in stasis there may have been ideas but it wasn't in public view like it is now not even elena who said i didn't even know there was a giant awakening under florida it just happened to be that we were guided to have that conference at that point um but off planet um i hadn't heard much information from anyone other than chris o'connor on saturn and he kept, when we, when I did my regression with him, he was talking about something he could see that looked like the Death Star of Star Wars. And it turned out, you know, cut to less than one year later, that he has remembered that Mimas, the moon in the ring nearest to the, the physical body of Saturn, um, is a, a, an international space station for many, many, many different beings and meetings. And Chris has been part of a diplomatic um, uh, arm um, of, let's say, the United Nations um, 
And, uh, but you know, I, I never want to say that I'm so disgusted with every earth system right now. I just have no trust and zero respect for any of them because we know the suffering that has occurred through those systems and by their hands. But Chris was uh, somebody who was involved in some of these conversations and he will share more. And that's really for him to share too. Um, but as far as that knowledge of the Anunnaki um, and Ia, Prince Enki, or Prince Ia Enki, um, who's not going to come back on the planet. There's some bloke going around right now saying that he's Enki. Enki's not physically going to come to the planet <laughs> right now. Um, I don't think I would either um, after everything that's gone on. Um, but I think at this stage, that's the maximum I can share that I know, um, but I am just delighted. What I don't like the idea of, I don't like the idea of any anybody, um, an Enki and Enlil, I don't care who they are, um, don't mess with my planet. Don't mess with my brothers and my sisters. If you did genetically interfere um, and created harm and havoc on the humans on the planet, then get it right, put it right. Thank you very much. Um, and, and for me, one of the greatest gifts a human can give themselves right now, Dr. Michael Sala, is the gift of stepping into their own love frequency and stop looking at authority. Stop walking around like bloody Muppets, all waiting to be told what to do. You know, the healing starts here. There's nobody in charge of us. Um, you know, we are beautiful beings. We are powerful beings. We get to decide more than we've ever been told. Um, so this is where we're at. And um, so the Earth Alliance working off planet, that's important because it puts Earth um, at less risk than it was. You know, this has been a prison planet with all these bossy buggers out there taking a shot part, taking a piece of the planet, harming our little ones. I mean, so much has gone horribly wrong here. They all need to stand in the corner. You're absolutely right that we as a planet, as a collective population on this planet, get to decide our future. And that is happening right now. And I think one of the biggest contributions that um, Elena has made um, as a contactee is that she has put out information that really is a, a kind of positive vision of what is happening um, in our solar system and that many others are corroborating that. And, and and one of the things, of course, is uh, the Saturn, that Saturn was a former Anunnaki base that was associated with the, the Enlil faction, and that this was part of what David Icke called the kind of Saturn moon uh, matrix that created this, ma this control ma matrix for planet Earth. And Elena has said now, because of Enki's return and that he's atoning, that he had the authority to hand over those old Anunnaki bases on Saturn to the Earth Alliance. And so one of the things that I think is very important is, well, how how do we kind of like deal with people who are coming up with these really fear-based narratives about what lies ahead, that, you know, they're talking all bringing up all these negative scenarios and trying to get a lot of people to buy into their negative scenario, whether it's an AI threat, whether it's a reptilian invasion, whether it's uh, some kind of, uh, kind of micronova that wipes out humanity. People are pushing these fear narratives. And of course, Elena, Alex, I know you, myself and others, we're, we're pushing this kind of more positive vision of where we're going. So how important is that? You know, those that I think right now, for those that have the eyes to see and the hearts to feel and start to trust their own instincts more, anyone at this stage of this ascension that we're going through, our planet, she is literally ascending physically. And we're not always remembering this. If she is physically ascending in the solar system and we are beings in, in agreement with her, we're physically in agreement with Mother Earth because we're living upon her, breathing her air, et cetera, heartfully connected to her heart in the center of the planet. Then as she is ascending and upgrading, therefore we are too. So all of the old programs that kept everything stuck, they cannot, do not, will not function, the 3D fear-based programs. So as we are ascending and moving higher into that love frequency, we're going to start seeing and connecting more to that feeling of love, 
those that spew and espouse fear, the solar flash will boom, it will upgrade you. What everyone wants to get tasered by the sun? I don't think so. You know, we need to start thinking for ourselves, how would I feel if that happened? What resonates with me? You know, there's a lot of shiny people at the moment. They've popped up, popped up, popped up, and they are sharing information and they're beautiful to look at and they have a way of capturing hypnotically um, and people are like donk, da, donk, da, donk, because that's part of their brainwashing from the age of zero even in in vitro you know the things that were put in their bodies from the beginning to even now um, and so we need to I believe those that really do want to live a loving life and have a happy uh, present going into a happier future where they're more empowered they need to just unplug everything stop watching the news stop jumping from one youtube channel to the next to the next to the next because you might as well put the news on people are programming people on youtube i know youtube is still run by bad people because i got yanked the other day uh, struck down again for talking about this with dr christiane northrup so i had to go to rumble um, so until the channels stop being yanked down, I know that the white hats are not fully in charge of whatever you want to call them, the white hats, whatever, the good guys and women. Um, they're still really dark people running every platform. And so just with that, know that there is programming, there is um, manipulation happening with the people that, you know, they could look at you and I and say, oh, that's Salah and Henderson or, you know, they're right, you know, yeah, fine, whatever. But those that do have an ability, just to, just for a second, open your heart and just feel, does it resonate? If I am frightened in any way, how's that going to help me survive? This is what I want people to start thinking. If I'm scared in any way, what am I going to do? I'm going to react. I'm going to respond. I'm going to plug in my survival mechanism. What does that mean? That means I will do anything, anything for myself and my family to survive. And if it means getting in line, getting in a bunker, taking a taking some medicine I don't want to take, um, giving all my money up, signing up to a digital currency only run by people that decide, but they're going to protect me from the invasion of the dark aliens and I'm going to do it. That is total fear porn, fear based and not truth or reality. Not truth or reality. We at our core are loving beings. This is our opportunity to get back in touch with that. Anything fearful is a trap. It's a trap in my opinion. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think, you know, we need to be aware of many different possibilities that, that these are all possibilities, but we also need to be mindful of our collective power to manifest. And, and we need to kind of like understand that uh, we collectively, as we share these stories and put our energy into one particular narrative or another, that we actually help shape uh, the future. And so that's why I, I decided some time ago to, to stop working with people that do put out a fear narrative and, and, and work with the people that are putting out a positive narrative, you know, because I think that not that the ones putting out a fear narrative are, are, are wrong and idiotic or something like that, but it's like, you know, we, as we are powerful manifestors and, and as we get bigger and bigger audiences, you know, we influence more people to kind of think along a certain direction. So if we we if we're getting if we're encouraging people to think in that positive direction to manifest this future, and I know this is the work uh, that you're doing, and Elena is doing, Alex Collier is doing, um, many others are putting their energy into this positive vision that we will help bring that about, and we are in alignment with the ascending Gaia energies. And, and that's really where the ascension comes in. You know, there's a lot of people out there talking about ascension, giving classes on ascension and putting out fear narratives. And it's like, how is that related to ascension? <laughs> ascension is putting out this positive vision and influencing others around you to kind of feel and align with that, not putting out this fear porn. Yeah, it, it's such the wrong, wrong route to go. And again, you know, at our, at our most intimate center of self, in everyone, you know, things that make people happy in a moment is thinking about, you know, jungle, the mountains, the oceans, the being the dolphins, the, you know, and again, you can override so much of, of your, your, your environment with all these negative people. Each person has control um, over their mind, their imagination, and the feelings that the imagination creates. You've got to have your imagination keeping on working. 
you use your imagination to bring the information. And of course, at seven years old is the main age where that's shut down. Father Christmas is a lie. The fairies don't exist, this, that and the other. So we're told all this magic at the beginning. And then so we're hardwired for magic and being open. And then by seven, it's it's killed in, in, in many of us. Um, and and so as the adults are awakening, for me, the greatest, greatest healing within all of us is inner child. You sit with your inner child, you go back, you find those happy memories. And then people say, I can't find a single memory. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. That's a lie. Stop lying to yourselves. Um, because everyone's got a happy memory somewhere. And you go back and you literally, when you're going back in your mind, Dr. Sala, and you are thinking back on that inner child that is within you, and you find that happy moment, something releases inside your physical body cellular fluids just beautiful memories and from that point you can literally imagine coming up energetically and overriding so much of the trauma within you you know there isn't a single person on the planet that is going to be able to predict your whole life for you or you know these women that give all their power to their men and men who give all their power to their women like why would we give our power away we do it because we're programmed we've been programmed from day dot always to look at the god the gods, the power outside, but the power is within. That's how we get to where we're going. That's how we get rid of all the fear porn and recognize who's lying, who isn't. You know, I have compassion for those people. Um, yesterday was a terrible day for some online uh, beatings that a certain friend took um, and I jumped in. I often will jump in, I'm a bit feisty. I make no apology for that. That's me still needing to heal um, and control some of my, um, my own ways I react uh, but bullying and judging uh, is a well, bullying particular bullying other people is a big thing especially women and men are bullying women um, but anyway you know I, I feel like well because of the frequency that we're in because this this 4d energy has been unleashed and we are feeling it more and more we can't shove it back down it's too late it's out there and so every single and I spoke to Alex Collier yesterday and he said the same thing um, he said that there's nowhere for anyone to stuff their pain anymore. It's done. So when people are attacking other people online, like naming their names and saying terrible things online, they're doing that because their own agony is right at the top now. It's right here. And so they're going to keep attacking and attacking and screaming and wishing harm on others because their own agony and pain from childhood to now is up for healing. You know, and it's a horrible place to be. It hurts. It's painful. But that's our opportunity right now, because that 4D energy that we all felt at the conference. Do you remember how the conference felt? Oh, it was a wonderful conference. And I think uh, people that attended that did feel this kind of sense of community at the conference. That was amazing. I mean, we had, uh, as you said, nearly a thousand people there. And there was a very strong feeling of connection and family there uh, for a lot of people uh, and for myself included you know it's a very memorable uh, event and you know kudos to you for pulling that off it's it's not an easy thing to put together a big conference like that a major international conference and and you and you did you put together a really incredible event so you know kudos to you um, and you know you're you're here and I guess this is this is part of your mission to put together these these are conferences, and I hope I hope you're comfortable with that because I I think uh, you know you're, you're planning to do another one. Um, any kind of announcements that are going to be coming soon about that? Yeah, we're definitely doing. See, the thing is, here's a, a key for me as well in life. If you want to be successful in your life, know what you're good at, and then surround yourself with genius. With genius. And I was so lucky to attract the best team that I could not have pulled that beautiful JISIC event off without the team at all. We all knew what our strengths were. Um, and uh, yes, and I said, people kept saying, what about next year or when we do it next year? And I kept saying, stop it. No, let's just keep the container. Let's see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if we're going to sell tickets. If, if there's, if my agenda was many different things, but for you guys as speakers, to pay you a speaker fee, to pay for your flights, to pay for your hotel rooms, because I actually imagine that that's what happens. It doesn't. It turns out that there are people that have to pay to stand on stages. I find that horrific. 
because without any speakers, there is no conference. But anyway, uh, this is how I chose to do it. And so I was more worried about, oh my God, am I gonna be able to pay everyone um, what, you know, what I promised to pay them um, and if we don't sell enough tickets. And, and it just was so beyond, it was beyond everyone got paid, the hotel bills got paid. It was just so, so amazing. Um, and such a loving connection. And I've said it a few times, but not on your channel. One of the things for me was at the start of each session, I was sat at the back of the stage, which was not planned. It was in spontaneous. That just happened as the three days rolled on. And I would pick a really upbeat song. And then they would put Renee, our AV man, the director would play that song. And then I would come up you know, kind of dancing and getting everyone going, knowing they're going to be sitting down for the next hour and a half. So let's get them all, you know, heart pumping. And, and till the day I die, I know I'm never going to forget how many faces, the people, the beaming, there were really old people there. There were children there. There was everybody in between. And I just wanted to look either side and smile and say hi and engage. The love, their hearts were so open, that collective frequency was I have never whoo, never felt anything like it it was so and the, and so when we're doing our uh, broadcast now people keep saying I'm crying again I'm watching Tony Wood Riggs and Chris O'Connor and Elaine and Danan and I'm crying again because they were at the conference so something so magnificent amplified there with that thousand people and at the same time with Ketsa Shah um, you know uh, opening um, opening frequency connecting to a portal focusing energy on the giants, the, 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 the key pieces, the synchronicities that were all going to happen at this time as our planet is ascending, you know, as this play is playing out. I mean, just so beautiful. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes, that was good. So where do people go if they want to watch any of the recordings of the speaker presentations at the conference? They go to Vimeo. And it's literally Galactic and Spiritual Informers presentations. So Galactic Spiritual Informers, or just try putting GISIC, G-S-I-C, into, um, into that. I was just trying to think, because John Charles put one up on Facebook, uh, but not everybody has Facebook. Uh, but yeah, Vimeo, that's where all the recordings are. So you can buy all three days, which is over 15 hours, um, or you can just get an individual um, an individual um, presentation from Dr. Michael Sala or Elena Danan or Alex Collier, Ketsa Shah, Tony Rodriguez, Brad Olson, Laura Eisenhower. Um, I know there were others I could never remember all of the names. Sunbo True Brother, who connects to the SAS. Did you, you interviewed him, didn't you, a while ago? I did, yes. Oh, so lovely. You know, uh, Sunbo, I really, really respect him. He was the only one, James Gilliland, but Sumbo, Sumbo True Brother, he lives eight hours inland in Canada, and it would have taken eight hours to get to the airport. He doesn't have a modern day phone because he's a mountain man. He communes with the Yeti, with the Bigfoot, with the Sasquatch. And so it was much more kind to not physically force him to be in that room with those people um and stand on stage he asked can I zoom and I'm like of course you can you know because he's a different human thank goodness he brings his information guys his book is so brilliant do you know the publishers wouldn't let him publish the word Sasquatch or Bigfoot he had to call it the hairy humanoid I mean what are they so scared of everything um so anyway all the information is out now every species every experience that we have we talk about it and we don't allow anyone to shut us down. There's way too many people coming forward. Um, the other person I didn't mention, James Gilliland, um, and James Gilliland shared with us on Zoom, he couldn't physically get there, but I thought we can't not include him and his latest UFOs, motherships, cylinder ships, scout ships that come to his land at Mount Adams. And if the, if the press, if the Western media um, had half a bean for a brain, uh, which is highly doubtful, all they have to do is gather the information that people film on their camera phones at James Gilliland's ranch, a SETI ranch, and play it on the global news. You know, we wouldn't have had to go through such agony. So you have to ask yourselves, they are forced now to wake up. That James Webb telescope, of course they had to bang that out there. 
What did Elena Denen say? Elena Denen said last March, she said, at some point, they will be telling us the Trappist, the Trappist star system will be one of the first other systems that potentially holds life on NASA. I'm so embarrassed for you. You know, it took a woman, it took Elena Denen. So now NASA have to go, by the way, uh, we, uh, we, uh, the James Webb Telescope found the Trappist system. It's like, come on guys. It's like to the world, if you want to know what's going on, just go on elenadenan.org, elenadenan.org. Go on alexcollier.org, Alex Collier R. Andromedan. Alex Collier, as you know, on most Fridays, that man puts on the most astonishing webinar. And it is so popular, that man does not hold back. He is, every single week, there's something from the Earth Alliance, something from the White Hat, something from this government, something from this... Uh, Andromedan, uh, Monet, his contact Monet, something about technology being released. Like, if you want to know up to the minute, guys, Alex Collier's webinar, alexcollier.org, it's as cheap as chips, but he can't speak online. You know, he's been threatened to be murdered and maimed, or his family were going to be slaughtered. That man, for over 30 years, he's a legend to me, a legend. Um, and so, guys, yeah, if you want the up to date every single week, alexcollier.org, get yourselves over there, right? He's brilliant, isn't he? And I know people like Dr. Christiane Northrup are listening every Friday, you know, another medical legend on our planet. I mean, yeah, we've got the resources now. Yeah, well, it's all, all there in Alex. I mean, I remember interviewing him well, many years ago, and he, he said he doesn't know all of the stuff that was downloaded into him because they downloaded all of these gestalts and it's like wow when is it going to come out but it's coming out in these webinars that he puts out there as you said i think three times a, a month and uh it's all coming out I, and i watch it uh, i'm always looking forward to it and um, again he's putting out a message a positive message and um yeah it's very very important so i want to bring this to a close so you know finally if you just tell people where they go to kind of find out more about you and also your final words or any pearls of wisdom for what's coming in 2023. You know, I, I would say that, you know, my, my channel, my YouTube channel is Danny, D-A-N-I, Danny Spiritual Therapist, or just look up Danny Henderson and you can find the beautiful, there's even a beautiful broadcast on the great doctor, Dr. Michael Saller, where I interviewed him from his little child, little boyhood, into his adult manhood. And that is a fascinating, your story is equally fascinating as you know, as, as a lot of the others. Um, so that's how you can contact me. Uh, we will be announcing a second GISIC because um, so many people want it. And so I'm absolutely so happy to be able to do that again for people. So that will be being announced in January. Um, my, my words are, know that you are loved and know that you are loved. And this is the scariest, bumpiest, most thrilling, exciting, awakening time in every single one of us. Not one single one entity has all their answers and anyone that says they do is a liar, liar, pants on fire. Um, so connect with people that you resonate with, um, stand up for yourself, connect internally, keep building that love frequency in you. And the next um days weeks months oh my goodness the greatness that's coming that's unfolding is to, it's going to be something to behold for definite they will be my my final words to your beautiful audience and thank you for having me dr sala i love you so much well thank you danny for for sharing your your background uh, your incredible experiences and talents and and for this amazing work that you're doing in in giving people a very positive vision and 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 getting them together at these uh, annual conferences. Very important. So thank you and aloha. Aloha. Mahalo.